reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Uh, this is a profound Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Wow, what a section. Uh, this injunction to be subject to one another, um, on the surface, may not sound like a positive action. Um, it may be because we don't tend to think of being subject or submit uh, to others as anything uh, that would contribute to my well-being. And it makes us ask the question, why would Paul say such a thing? And why would it be perceived as necessary or even desirable? One thing that shocked me when I found out years ago in reading this biblical text, that's Ephesians 5.22, where he says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. There's no verb in the sentence. And in reading this verse, you have to supply the understood verb. Well, what is that understood verb? Well, traditionally, the nearest verb is to be subject, and it's from verse 21. And so you have, in all the history of English translations, uh, the insertion of the verb, verb uh, subjecting. Uh, what's interesting is to look at this and ask if that's all that Paul had in mind with his readers, because subjecting is only one of three verbs that have ing in this immediate context attached to them. And uh, in our English translations, uh, we call these verbal participles speaking, giving thanks, and submitting. And we mentioned last week, and I think we mentioned it rather quickly, but we pointed out that these three verbs help us understand what Paul is getting after when he says, be filled with the Spirit. That when we speak to one another in psalm and hymns and spiritual songs, and when we are giving thanks in all things for what God is doing, and submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, that's the Spirit-filled life. Notice that these three actions aren't just kind of something that you do, but Paul's real clear. There are three actions that are to each other and to one another. So when we start talking about relationships, Paul is very pointed in that these actions of speaking, giving thanks, and submitting are to be done to each other and to one another. It's the mutual action that's crucial in understanding what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Husbands and wives then, and immediately in uh, this next paragraph, effectively are to be speaking to one another from joyful hearts, giving thanks constantly for how they see God working in their relationship, and having an attitude of submission as they relate to one another. You see, being subject to one another doesn't have a note of negativity. Now, we, we can take it that way, but rather it's a beautiful submission 
of one's self-will for the good of the other. And if indeed we are spirit-filled people, it's going to be demonstrated in our relationships with others and especially with our spouses. Uh, this whole focus in this big long paragraph that I've just read um, focuses on what one writer says is the style or the way of the cross and the accent on right relationships harmonize beautifully with Jesus' teachings. And so that's kind of the background for where I want us to go tonight. These, there, there are, let's see, at least three. Uh, there's at least three passages in the New Testament that deal with household duties or instructions for Christian households. Uh, I read one of them. Uh, turn over to Colossians 3, and I want to begin with verse 18. Now, this one, as you listen to it, you, you can see pretty quickly, it's not as detailed as the one in Ephesians. Beginning with Colossians 3.18, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it, and do it not only when their eye is on you, and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. And whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters." since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. And masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Then there's one other that is uh, a lot like it. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I want to begin reading uh, verse 13. Notice how in Peter it starts off, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, and that's whether to the emperor or the supreme authority or to governors. And then he says, let's see, uh, verse 18, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it's commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. Um, and then he goes on down. Uh, elaborates on that. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Uh, then if you look down in chapter 3, verse 7, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. And then like in, I think in the other uh, two readings in Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Peter also goes, finally, all of you. So they'll, they'll be addressing the different groups within the households, and then finally he addresses uh, the entire group itself. These uh, there's a technical term for these that people have come up with, and it basically just means household tables. And it's almost the idea of, uh, think about when you were growing up. Uh, your parents would teach you and give you instructions on table manners. Remember that? <laughs> Elbows off the table. <laughs> uh, 
Don't speak with your mouth full. You know, just all kinds of table manners. Uh, that's kind of what this idea of household tables, it has to do with the kind of manners in which the relationships in the household, are. that's how they're supposed to function. Now, what's interesting and very fascinating is that uh, all over the ancient world, there were writers and philosophers who would give instruction for household management. Uh, this is not new. Now, now, when we come across the New Testament, we think it's new. It's not. It, I, let me give you a good parallel. And when I say this, you'll recognize it real quick. Uh, think about when you're checking out at the grocery store and you look over and there's a magazine and there's an article on the front page entitled something like, How to Manage Your Household Wisely. <laughs> you know, so we're used to seeing this kind of stuff everywhere. Well, it was the same thing in the ancient world, uh, that there were philosophers and writers who were constantly trying to get the word out, here's how you need to manage your family. And we're going to look at some of these parallels, uh, but I want to I have a question that kind of hangs over this that we will seek to answer toward the end. Because when, when, I, when I read the ones that we know that, that have been left to us uh, from ancient writings, uh, you ask the question, what's the difference between how Paul handles it and how the philosophers or other writers handle it? And it's, it, in fact, on one of the PowerPoints, I put it up there uh, very specifically so you can see the difference. It's quite telling in how Paul handles it uh, differently. Um, there were Stoic philosophers. Remember when we get into Acts, uh, there are the different philosophers that Paul uh, met in Acts 17. Well, in, in the Stoics, one of their philosophers um, would detail duties to gods. You had duties to the city, and you had duties to the household. And again, that was very kind. That, that was kind of very popular for philosophers to write about that. Um, there were other descriptions by Greek writers, Roman writers even Hellenistic Jewish writers. Uh, Seneca, who lived 4 B.C. and died about the same time we think the Apostle Paul did, A.D. 65. He was a Roman Stoic philosopher. And um, it's interesting because he was a tutor and an advisor to Emperor Nero. But later on, Nero thought he was involved in a plot. So Nero forced him to commit suicide. Uh, but... At one point, Seneca wrote this. How a husband should conduct himself towards his wife, or how a father should bring up his children, or how a master should rule his slaves. This department of philosophy is accepted by some people as the only significant part of philosophy. So it's almost like he's talking about what we might call practical philosophy, that until you start talking about how everybody needs to treat each other and how everybody's supposed to live within the household, how the husband treats his wife, how the father brings up his children, and how the master rules his slaves, that's the important stuff you need to be talking about. And that's what Seneca wrote. Um, I found a quote I wanted to share with you from, um, I think it's from Aristotle on this same uh, topic. I think the more I read, the more I was intrigued with how a lot of writers in the ancient world would offer all kinds of guidelines for household duties. And what dawned on me is, as I thought more and more about it and became aware of the thinking, um, and of course Plato was responsible for this too, but think about early writers who made the case that the stability of the home is the stability of the nation. And they believed that. And based on that philosophy, they thought it was crucial that parents in the home know how to raise their children so that the state could be stable. Um, let's see. Let me find... Yeah, I wanted to share with you one of the readings. Here... Here's how Aristotle describes it. 
He says, now that it is clear what are the component parts of the state, because he talked about um, in his work on politics, he's talked about uh, everything that makes up the state. We first of all need to discuss household management. For every state is composed of households. Logical conclusion. The investigation of everything should begin with the smallest parts, and the primary and smallest part of the household are master and slave, husband and wife, father and children. We ought therefore to examine the proper constitution and character of each of these three relationships. And so uh, that's just an example of how the ancient world was very much aware of the role that the management of the home played in the stability of society. I mean, it was everywhere. So when Paul comes along and says what he says in Ephesians and Colossians, and Peter writes what he does in 1 Peter, this isn't something new that they've not heard before. Uh, most of his readers you know, have been exposed to household management. But we're going to look at things that make it uh, unique for the Christian. When we, when we look at its function uh, in antiquity, uh, there were characteristics. I'll look at the uniqueness in Paul a little bit. There were characteristics of these household table manners, instructions for management of the household, three main characteristics that seem to tie the thread of all of them. First is that when it comes to the idea of being in subjection, the philosophers and, and even the New Testament teaching was very high on talking about putting yourself in voluntary submission. And, and, and if you think about it, it's the thinking that there were sort of different levels of submission. Uh, there was the level that the slave had. He had no say. Uh, but there are also nuances of submission uh, that involved free, uh, vo voluntary choice. Living for others is best when in the context of the affirmation of one's freedom and personhood in Christ. See, see think about what Ephesians 5.21 means. To submit yourself to one another. It's a voluntary act. Because I'm free in Christ, I do it for Christ. I know it's going to have a beneficial effect on the both of us. That's why I do it. And no one's forcing me. And so in relationships in the body of Christ, uh, this voluntary aspect is very important. Now, the Stoics, when they would teach this, they wanted to make sure that if you talked about uh, it being um, voluntary, it was directed to a person being considered noble, that you are a person of dignity. Well, in the New Testament, there's a different approach to this. When it comes to the Christian life, there is the overwhelming agreement and assumption that when you become a Christian, you still are a free moral agent you have the opportunity to make your choices. And when you make those choices, uh, you voluntarily submit yourself in the relationships that are important. Uh, it it kind of comes to the second aspect, and that's of freedom itself. This accent on Christian freedom in Paul is amazing to me. I don't know if you've ever done a study of Christian freedom it almost sounds a little scary. <laughs> because on the one end, I can overstate it, it almost sounds like, in some of the ways that Paul words things, I'm going to do whatever it takes, and I'm going to be as flexible as I need to be, and I'm going to be as free with my faith and practice as I need to be to bring people to Christ. And there are places where it sounds like Paul almost overstates his case. You're like, and it makes you feel uncomfortable when you read it. And yet for Paul, this notion of Christian freedom is fundamental to one's identity in Christ. And what it raises then 
is a huge issue for the body of Christ. What do you do in a situation where two Christians who are exercising their freedom bump up against each other <laughs> with different ideas? And, and, and Paul in Romans gives us some wise guidelines on that. But for Paul, this value of Christian freedom is very important. In Christ, and this is sort of a dual thing at once, it's, it, it's even hard to describe, because Paul tries to wrestle with it, and I wonder if his readers got it. When you become a Christian, you're free, but you may not be. You're free in Christ, and you realize that your ultimate allegiance is to God and Christ and living in the Spirit. And yet, just because you've become a Christian, that doesn't give you the freedom to walk away from your master. At a certain level, you're still subordinate to that master. But because you've become a Christian, there's a whole different mindset now. So much so that both Paul and Peter can suggest of all things, you still remain faithful to the master who treats you harshly and bitterly. See, just think of how many Christians would have said, Aha, I am now free in Christ. My master treats me this way. Look, I don't have to take it. I can just leave. After all, I'm not in submission to them anymore. I'm only you know, submitted to the Lord. Paul goes, oh, now, no, wait a minute. <laughs> he, he wants them to make sure they don't um, abuse that freedom in Christ. The call to voluntary submission can only be given when the person is in the state of freedom and they recognize their worth and dignity. One writer says this, When we're fully aware of our oneness in Christ, in the body of Christ, when we know we have been fully accepted and forgiven by God and our brothers and sisters, we can respond to the call for submission to others. We're to be subordinate or submissive because of the person and work of Christ. And we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. Then there is what a lot of writers, when they look at uh, all three of the big household tables uh, in, in uh, Paul's writing and Peter's that we've read, and you look at also the ancient writings that we have, the third thread that runs through it all is what's called reciprocity. Uh, and for the Christian, it's, it's addressed to... Here's the fascinating thing. The person who seems to be the one in a dominant position in a relationship is given just as much responsibility as the one who isn't. There is an interesting mutual deference to one another. You're a person of worth and dignity. No matter our work relationship, I treat you that way. A person of worth and dignity. Same way between husbands and wives. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, and we don't have time tonight to go into it. A lot of stuff in the ancient world where that women were viewed, and this was even written by some of the philosophers, they were viewed as possession of the husbands, and in fact inferior to the husbands. There's, a, there's an entire work that I was reading by Xenophon. It's called Household Duties. And, and in that, he has a discussion between two individuals about their wives. And the wives are supposed to do indoor work, supposed to cook, supposed to keep the clothes clean, and they're not supposed to go outside. I mean, it's real clear the role of women in their culture. Now, not everybody in the ancient world agreed with that, but that was a pretty dominant view in many, many places. What's that? <laughs> Now, in this reciprocity, this mutual deference, there's a reason why both care for each other. It's because Jesus is the master for both parties. So that when both are Christians, master and slave, it elevates that relationship. Husband and wife, when both are Christians, it elevates that relationship. The trick was... Um, if, and this is where uh, especially the Roman state felt threatened, 
if the one who was viewed in, this, in the inferior role, slave, wife, sometimes child, there are occasions where the child would become the Christian, nobody else in the family would. So if you had those individuals viewed in the inferior position, becoming Christians, that was viewed as a threat to the stability of society. Um, there's a guy named John Fitzpatrick, and I think he's somehow connected to Pepperdine. I can't remember where he's at right now. He's, he's written an article where he's done research out of all the ancient sources. One of the things that just amazed me is the recognition that there was domestic abuse was a method by which the head of the family would keep people in their place. And that's why, especially in 1 Peter, you have a lot of stuff written to the wives and to the slaves because you had a lot of situations where wives, slaves, would become Christians. But the master would not, and neither would the husband. And the husband often would resort to domestic violence uh, to keep family and social order. And it was approved of. And oh my, when you, get, when you read through the sources we have and what people did to wives and slaves to keep them in their place, it's pretty shocking. Um, I, I knew that we wouldn't have time tonight to read all that. But just for you to be aware that in the Greco-Roman world, domestic abuse was recognized and uh, accepted as a proper method for keeping everything uh, kind of stable in its place. Well, <laughs> and then that brings it to today, doesn't it? Uh, and and what, what's fascinating is that Paul's aware of this, Peter's aware of this, so he's addressing Christians in their cultural setting to try and help them Let's see, how can I say this? I get the impression that Paul already knows that the Christian faith is revolutionary in its effect on people to start with. What he doesn't want to happen is for it to become a revolutionary movement that's designed to destroy all of culture as they know it. Uh, it's fascinating that Paul tries to work within cultural boundaries. Uh, and... and when we look at it, we might think, well, maybe Paul didn't go far enough with some of the things that he should have reached out and tried to change. But you see, Paul understands that within his culture, if you get too countercultural, uh, you think they had a persecution the way they did, they would have really been uh, wiped out or people even more attempted uh, to wipe them out. Now, when we get to the function and uniqueness of these household codes, especially in Ephesians. It starts off with wives and, and probably a reference uh, when it says to husbands. It, it is a response to what one person says, marriages, of course, many of them in the ancient world were arranged. And as you know, the morals were very loose. And so you have a lot of Christians coming into the body of Christ. That's just their culture. Arranged marriages, loose morals. So he begins to give instructions to each of the groups. And I want you to notice what is unique to Paul, uh, and Peter does this too, what is unique to the New Testament instructions for household management is how, and, and this is a great example here in Ephesians, every single group that he addresses, he's going to tie his instructions to the Lord. Wives, you submit to yourself, yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. Like the body of Christ submits itself to the Lord. But notice it's as to the Lord. So for Paul, it's not just wives putting up with their husbands. It's not just wives uh, maybe dominating their husbands, trying to get rid of them, or just a whole lot of options, but your conduct is as to the Lord. 
for the husband. You love your wives as also Christ loved the church. He roots it in the activity and the love of Christ. Look at the children. Children, you obey your parents in the Lord. The instructions that he gives to the father, he gives this expression, it's of the Lord. To the master, or to the slaves, or the bond servants, you work as to Christ, not to people you're working for. You're not just trying to please people and, uh, and do a snow job on them. You realize you're working as to Christ. Instructions to the masters, guess what? You're accountable because you got a master in heaven. And then the last one, instructions to everyone, to brothers. Finally, be strong in the Lord, all of you. It's interesting. I think it's telling that the uniqueness of what Paul does and Peter does with what was ordinarily known as household management instructions, they're tied into the Lord. Think of how many Christian families probably have had difficulty understanding that. That all sorts of things have gone on in families that don't honor the Lord and families don't realize that each one of these have a relationship to and they're accountable to the Lord. So that for Paul, these groups within the body of Christ and within the home are accountable to and answerable to Jesus Christ as Lord. So you have group instructions then within the body of Christ. You have the husband-wife relationship. And I want to look. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Um, you're going to find two different ways that the word submit is used. Uh, back in chapter 1, let's see if I can find it. I think it's in verse 22. Everything is under subjection to Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 24, the church submits to Christ. Uh, notice how Christ is right in the center of this submission. It's first going to be worldly powers and authorities that don't know Christ, but they're going to submit. Wives, voluntarily, this is where we get our uh, three different things that we mentioned related to uh, this submission. But wives, you submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Think about how voluntary submission is at the heart of our Christian freedom. And I would say that it's the heart, it's at the heart of marriage freedom. We don't see, we don't often think about husbands and wives being free to serve and love each other. Too many people think of husband-wife relationship as somehow it keeps me from fully enjoying life. And uh, I'm always intrigued and have seen couples through the years that act as if the worst thing ever happened to them was that they got married. And they don't look at it as uh, a mutual freedom where they can love and serve one another. They look at it as the opposite. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other counseling issue, isn't it? Um, their parent-child relationship. Uh, this is fascinating. Uh, we, you assume, here's what's interesting, you sort of assume that as Paul is writing to these different groups within the body of Christ, that he's writing to uh, all Christians. And then it's the master-servant relationship. What does the Christian master look like? And what does the Christian slave look like? Conversion, I think I mentioned this earlier, when it related to conversion, conversion could be viewed by society as a dangerous insubordination. 
And that may be why it's hard for us uh, to think regarding the threat that Christianity had in the Greco-Roman culture. Um, there are a lot of things that people feared about early Christians. Uh, Pliny, in his uh, correspondence with Trajan, uses an interesting metaphor. Uh, he, he looks at Christianity spreading throughout Asia Minor uh, as a dangerous virus or a contagion. And now think about what that would imply. So that people were fearful of Christians. Many of your religious uh, priests and leaders in the uh, Greek and Roman religions looked at Christianity as a threat to the practice of their own religion um, because for a while... Their temples were empty, um, sales were down on their idols. Uh, but one writer says, you know, maybe, maybe Christianity coming into our territory is a good thing. Because this writer notes that he's, he's noted more people coming to the temple. Uh, sales are up on the idols. <laughs> so if you feel threatened, uh, all of a sudden you're going to get busy and start practicing what you say that you believe. But early Christians lived in an antagonistic culture. And that's behind uh, a lot of Paul's concern that the home and the church not be viewed as subversing society. We've already talked about the idea of being subject in Rome in Ephesians. Um, they all are related to Christ's work. And I want to finish with this observation that's fascinating. Chapter 521, all the way down through 33, but probably including chapter 6, verse 5, there's the fear and respect idea. You submit to one another out of fear for Christ. Uh, some translations say reverence. But because you have an awe and reverence for who Jesus is, you submit to one another, a mutual deference for the. Now, I want to think about that for a minute. Because I have an awe and reverence for who Christ is, I'm going to submit to you. I don't know that the church has heard that message very well through the years. I don't know that I've practiced it very well through the years. Because of my reverence and fear for Christ, my awe for who He is, what He's done for me, how He has changed me, you know, I'm a new man in Christ, because everything Christ has done for me, I submit to you. Now that is really, really powerful. Now how you do that and what the issues are becomes the sticking point. Uh, because in Romans, when you have the issue of meat being offered to idols, and there were Christians who, uh, and Paul put himself in this category, ah, idols aren't anything. Uh, we know they're not alive. We know that meat was just offered, you know, in a meaningless sacrifice so I can eat it. Well, some Christians, no. And so you have a significant division within some of these metropolitan early churches because of meat offered to idols. And Paul is going to take, interestingly, some of these principles that we're learning just in this section. And in the book of Romans, you'll see him apply them to that very emotional, divisive issue. And there is no way that the early Christians, no matter which side you were on, they would never have looked at it as uh, an issue that uh, didn't make any difference. I mean, it made a lot of difference. And so much so that, that uh, unity in the body of Christ was threatened. And Paul has to come along and, again, give some guidelines. 
uh, big ones too that he knew were being violated. He said, you know, the kingdom is not meat and eat, you know, meat and drink and eating, but it's about righteousness. It's about love. It's about the work of the Spirit. He has to remind people, what is it really about? Um, and so we'll talk more about that uh, later. Now, this entire section ends in chapter 6 and verse 5. With slaves obeying your earthly masters, notice, notice with respect and fear. And it's not out of fear and trembling because of what their master might do to them. It's because the servant or the slave knows the Lord that he's accountable to. You know, you obey your earthly master with respect and fear, with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. And you don't do it just to win their favor when they're watching you. But as slaves of Christ, see, notice how he has changed their identity. You're not just any old slave. You're now a slave of Christ. And that makes a world of difference in how you interact with your master. Um, we have just barely touched the hem of the garment on so much of this uh, passage here that we've read tonight. But isn't it interesting that all through Ephesians, uh, we've been looking at principles and we've laid down uh, ways in which our identity is new in Christ, how we're supposed to think and act toward one another. And then we get to the point in Paul's letter where he's going to talk about different relationships in the body of Christ, being sensitive to the culture in which they live, so that people who are not Christian wouldn't look at these, these groups within the church and think of them as subversive groups, or that the whole purpose of Christianity is to destroy culture. But that even within the Greco-Roman mindset, that the home itself has a particular place for the stability of society. Paul works within that framework. Now, it raises a huge question that I want to ask. I don't know that we can answer it because the bell rang, but I want you to think about it. How important is it for the church to be aware of its culture and the framework in which it works? And the reason I'm asking is because some people leave the impression it doesn't matter, you know. I'm living in the kingdom. Culture doesn't matter. Well, that's not how Paul saw it. Um, now, he knew, and you see this early in Acts with Peter, uh, sometimes you are forced into an either-or decision. We must obey God rather than men. Remember that quote in Acts? Um, but that's not everything. And so... I see Paul's method of missions being very sensitive to the culture in which he lived because his number one goal was that people would hear and learn about Jesus. In fact, he kind of astounds us in the first part of Philippians when he says, I don't care if people were saying bad things about me. Only thing I care about is Jesus Christ being preached. And I'm like, really? <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't care. All he cares about is Jesus being preached. Well, uh, let's end with prayer and uh, appreciate you all coming tonight. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight with the realization that relationships are vital uh, in the church and in the home. And as Paul so clearly demonstrates, every single thing we do must be done with Jesus Christ our Lord as the focus and the one to whom we are accountable. May we be in submission to one another, and may we be aware of our responsibility in the relationships that we have at home, at work, in the church, and help us to be uh, sensitive to those, help us to portray the mind of Christ in every one of those, and help us uh, to have a servant attitude uh, to serve with Jesus Christ as our master, knowing that we have a new identity in Jesus Christ. Thank you for bringing us together tonight. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you all for being here tonight.